Okay, congratulations on this um, new film of yours, uh, Midnight Peep Show. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I feel a little guilty taking a lot of credit for it because essentially my role um, in the film is, it's reasonably significant. I do a lot of voiceover, but I never actually appear on camera. So it's a strange feeling doing um, just voice acting in a live action movie. I mean, certainly in an animated movie, you would do voice acting, you would like Shrek or something, and you would feel like you were part of the movie because everybody did voice acting. But I'm the only voice actor really in there and everybody else is on camera. So I feel I feel a little, shall we say, a little guilty taking an excessive amount of credit for something that I really, you know, did in a few hours. Well, it's, uh, it's also not to mention it's, it's technically um, it's one of those uh, anthology type of films, you right? Sure. It's a bunch of, uh, you know, shorter films put together into one one longer story. Correct. And I was, I'm the connect my my narrator narration is kind of the connective tissue that keeps um, the stories flowing, the wraparound, if you will. And, um, you know, I, I had met some of the people associated with the project when I was in, in England doing um, another thing, a, a film called Madness in the Method in 2017. And so they knew I was in town for a convention and they wanted to know if I wanted to be part of this. And I said, sure. And so they brought all of the um, sound recording equipment to my hotel room. And obviously I had I had, had the uh, script for quite some time. So I was prepared, but we did in fact bang out the whole thing, you know, take after take after take until they were happy in, in a few hours, you know, in my London hotel room. So it was um it was fun, it was challenging, and uh, and um hopefully it turned out well. I have not yet seen the the finished. 100% uh, finished product. I've seen bits and pieces of it. <laughs> so, so they, so they, did they approach you during this uh, conference or convention, or they approach you before you had headed off to? Uh... They approached me beforehand. Um, apparently, somebody had already taken a sort of a pass at the narration, and they just they thought that person was fine. They just didn't. They just thought it could be better. They thought it could be improved. They couldn't even really put their finger necessarily on what it was lacking. They just knew that when they listened to it, they just felt like it was missing something and they, they weren't even sure exactly what. Um, so they just decided to throw a little money at me and, and you know, see if I could possibly, you know, improve it with this, with, with another, you know, swing by the material. And I guess they were happy with it because they ended up using it and uh, found it advantageous to the project. So uh, yeah, I was happy. You always want to keep the customer satisfied, so to speak. So I was, I was happy I could step in and um, and in a you know a few you know two or three hours uh, fix what they felt was kind of a problem. I'm 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 also going to go out on the limb that this is, was your first time to ever do voice acting in a hotel room, you know, compared to like a a booth or something. Well, it's the first time I did voice acting in a hotel room, but certainly when I did my part um, of of the henchman in Gremlins: Secrets of the Mogwai during COVID, that was even crazier because I did it downstairs in the closet in this house, in the closet underneath my staircase, because there were no studios open due to, the, due to the, the lockdowns. So I was in the dark with a very small flashlight, listening to the director on a phone on a Zoom call, like I'm talking to you now, and on a computer with a microphone and inside my, my uh, closet, I had essentially done the equivalent of like stapling quilts everywhere so it, it, the sound would be nice and, and buffered and smooth. And so I did the entirety of uh, Gremlin Secrets of the Mogwai, you know, in a quilt lined closet underneath my stairs in pitch black in about two hours. So, you know, you do what you got to do. 
Uh, yeah, that 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 is true. All 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 for the art, of course. There you go. Now, Zach, um, this is not your first time doing a voice acting. So, how did how did you want to approach this character um, called the Game Master in 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 this film? Well, you know, when you get hired as an actor, sometimes you can you can do one of two things. You can come with tons of your ideas, and some of them are maybe out of the you know off the wall and a little out of the box. Um, or you can just try and sort of give the people who are hiring you what they want. And what they really wanted was somebody who was kind of intense, kind of mocking, kind of, um, I don't know, kept, you know, uh, had had it, it, a certain amount of investment in the game they were playing rather than sort of feeling detached from it so that the stakes were kind of, raised in other words that the game master really sort of is invested in what he's doing as opposed to oh this is time number 50 that he did it so i think there was an, an they wanted an element of urgency an element of investment an element of um you know kind of uh raising the stakes and, and a kind of sadistic enjoyment um, that like, you know, why is this person doing this? The person's doing it is because they they get off on it, essentially. So I basically just tried, you know, with such limited time um, to give them essentially what they wanted. And, you know, like I said, I try and keep the customer satisfied. Um, if I had had maybe a lot more time and a larger part and a more on-camera presence, maybe I would have sort of fought for some more of my own ideas but I really thought that their criticisms were, after hearing what the previous person had done, I really thought their criticism was pretty valid. And so I really just tried to essentially give them what they were uh, wanting all along. Well, it, it does leave the door open uh, for some something more uh, down the road uh, from from what I can gather. That that's That's for certain. Well, that's, you know, they call it show business for a reason. So it's, it's always better to you know, um, leave the door open than to shut it. As you can see, they're having some issues now with, with Barbie because the first film was so self-contained that they don't really know. They're at a little bit of a loss at the moment for how to do Barbie 2. And since it made a billion dollars, they're probably not that thrilled about that. But uh, you know, you always, uh, if, if you find a property and there's a way to extend it, if you're a business man, you're gonna wanna extend it, so yeah. Why not leave it open ended? Absolutely. Now the the se the segment that uh, that you're you're technically in it's titled uh, "Fuck Mary Kill," and um and 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 it is a it is a very good uh, segment, it's, but it, it it's in a I want to say it's a subgenre of horror that I like I like to call it like torture porn, you know type yeah you know, the, the you know like the Saw movies and so on. What 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 do you what do you personally love about uh, this this type of subgenre? Do you even watch this type of subgenre? You know, I mean, here's the thing. I like horror very much, but obviously, I grew up with films like The Thing and The Exorcist. Um, I also grew up with slasher films like the Friday the 13th and the Freddy movies and all of those were very popular too. Um, but the kills seemed to be very quick and they also had a certain degree of imagination, kind of like in the Final Destination movies or The Omen, um, right? Where David Warner, my late friend who I worked with three times would always love telling me the stories of his, you know, how many takes they had to do to get the his head to flip around multiple times when he got decapitated in the omen. Um, so, you know, I'm a bit more old school. And yeah, if you're talking about the sort of the hostile and the saw and some of those, uh, you know, you know, human centipede type horror films, you know, uh, that's, that's a little, that's a little out of my um, area of expertise, certainly not an area that I that I like to dwell in. Um, you know, like the Terrifier movies are a perfect example of, of that now. That's just not really my thing. And 
you know, but you have to, you kind of can't throw out the baby with the bathwater either to use a cliche. And so it, you know, at certain times you just kind of have to, uh, go with the, go with the flow. You don't necessarily have to approve of everything. You can look at it rather than a, a passion project, more of a professional project and, and, a, and a job. And I've been a working actor now this March will be 43 years. Very hard for me to say that. And, you know, um, there, I would say that half of the stuff I've done, I'm proud of. And the other half of the stuff that I've done was to, you know, be, was to work. And almost every actor does that. I mean, I'm not sure you'd have to ask him. I don't want to speak for him, but I'm not sure that, uh, you know, Robert De Niro really was dying to do the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. My guess is he did it because it was a nice payday. And I personally don't think there's anything wrong with that. Michael Caine's been doing that since Jaws the Revenge. So, you know, you have to, as an actor, you have to start kind of um, split the difference between loving what you're doing and doing what you're doing so you can keep doing what you love. That makes sense. Now, for, for such a long career like yourself, do you ever feel like uh, the projects that come your way um, boxes you in into a specific area? I, because I want to say over half your projects might be horror. Well, you know, what happens is it's always sort of um, the first impression, the Hollywood first impression is almost always the most lasting. So you, you make your big splash in a horror movie, people think you're a, a horror person. You know, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis, perfect example, she had to fight like crazy um, to get out of the horror genre. And, uh, you know, one of the things she used was her physicality and her sex appeal. I am not as attractive as Jamie Lee Curtis, and therefore I don't really have as many weapons as she does. So I was not fortunate enough, enough to do that. But what I did try and do was I did try and do things like surviving Family in Crisis, where I was doing, you know, where I was doing serious Romeo and Juliet style drama with Molly Ringwald and, and Marsh Mason, Ellen Burstyn, River Phoenix, et cetera, and try and show people that I could hang with the A-listers and stuff like that. So, you know, you just have to, um, you, you know, you're, it's very, with the exception of the people at the very, very tippy top, it's quite difficult to have full control over the direction of your career. You take a look even at someone like Tom Hanks, you know, he did Joe versus the Volcano and he got stuck doing Turner and Hooch and he fired his agents and said, I need to do a complete reboot here, and then did Philadelphia and Forrest Gump back to back. But if he hadn't done that, who knows what would have happened to his career? For all you know, he'd be doing Bachelor Party 4. So the fact of the matter is, you know, at a certain point, you really have to try and, 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 and take control of your career. And I did try and do that. I just, you know, I wasn't quite as successful, I certainly wasn't as successful as he was. He's kind of the exception uh, to the rule rather than the rule itself. It, it's hard to get people to work for you exactly the way you want them to and to then have the parts that you want to come your way exactly at the right time. I guess we could always consider Midnight Peep Show as a romantic thriller since it's a... Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> since, so they, they keep on referencing uh, Valentine's Day, you know, an, an upcoming holiday <laughs> for, for ourselves in, in this film. <laughs> now, um, how, I, we, we, we all know that uh, you're very well known um, for, uh, for, for Gremlins. And, you know, as, as a journalist, you know, we, we can never escape asking you these uh, Gremlin questions. It, it's, it's, it, it you know, do 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 you ever get tired of being tied back to Gremlins? I know you're you mentioned a few times that you're voicing it. You know that Gremlins is a secret of Mogwai. Sure. Well, I think it's interesting because I I go back and I look at a, a lot of other people who are kind of in the same situation that I am. You know, like Mark Hamill would be one. Um, not that I'm comparing myself to the Beatles, but like you sort of remember um, George Harrison for a while after the Beatles, he was tired of talking about it. He wrote kind of slightly snarky songs about it when we was fab, you know, 
and and all of that stuff. Um, and so I think there is a period where what happens is you get very associated with one thing. You get tired of being associated with one thing. And then you come out the other side and you're like, at least I'm associated with something. You know what I mean? And so like, I think maybe even, and again, I don't like to speak for people. It seems like Ralph Macchio kind of did that where he was like, the karate kid and then he was tired of being the karate kid and then cobra kai came along now he's thrilled to be the karate kid and he wrote a book about how great it was being the karate kid and so i think you do go through that like you know happy and then sick of it and then make peace with it it's kind of like elizabeth kubler ross's five stages of dying you know it's like what is it it's like anger denial bargaining depression and acceptance but instead you go through the thrilled with it, annoyed by it, accepting of it. And and sort of and really I'm very grateful to be um part of the Gremlins franchise. It's completely changed my life forever. And um and no, I don't I don't really get tired of it. I I now basically essentially see it as my job um to talk to talk about Gremlins and to be the spokesman for the franchise. And and I would certainly say that the animated series and the Mountain Dew commercial, the new stuff that helps that feeling a lot because there's a lot of potentially exciting gremlin stuff coming in the future. And that's, it's no longer sort of like just something in the past that will never be resuscitated. It could easily be resuscitated and be arguably just as good, if not maybe better in the future. I mean, I can tell you that Using the gizmo technology that I used in the uh, Mountain Dew commercial, the technology was so incredible and so much better than what we did in 1983. It's the equivalent of like, you know, people always say, what was it like? It's like it's comparing a rotary phone to a smartphone. There, there was just no comparison. It was like uh, the old gizmo was a relic from the past or maybe a, a Tesla to a horse and buggy. So, I mean, stuff that would have taken us literally weeks, we did in a few hours uh, and shot the, the the Mountain Dew commercial in an afternoon. Would have taken us 10 days minimum to shoot with the same technology. So uh, I'm I'm happy and, you know, please as punch to talk about Gremlins. I'll talk about it till I'm blue in the face. I got no problem with it because it's um, sort of, becoming re-becoming that's not really a word but becoming again i guess is uh the phrase i'm looking for you know becoming again kind of a part of the meta mm -hmm. and you see it all the time now i'm on twitter and, and uh or x as it's called now and and i'll see tons of tweets that reference feeding after midnight don't get them wet lots of rules-based jokes um, memes that have like gizmo and then he turns into you know uh, a, a gremlin will say like me in the morning before coffee me you know or, or me after coffee and stuff like that and so it's still um to me it still feels very current you know i mean uh it, uh, my phone around christmas every year just gets bombarded with stuff you know and it's just so amusing to watch yourself on the IMDb star meter, you know, go from like 5,000 to like the top 500 by Christmas Eve. So clearly if the star meter is to be believed, people are searching your name and looking you out and, and seeing what you're up to and what you look like now and all that stuff. I just got an email yesterday from someone wanting to do a documentary about me called Life After Gremlins. And I wanted to send an email back saying, Life After Gremlins is still going on. So it's um, it's it's something for which I'm very grateful. It's given me a very nice life, and uh, I, I I do not tire of. Wow, I mean, it's especially I I want to say this year marks what the 40th anniversary of Gremlins, and you know, um, I'm 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 not I'm not as young either, but I I I still remember watching that film in in the, the in the theaters. <laughs> sure. Well, what's what's so shocking is when you get to a certain age, you realize that 40 years ago it was not that doesn't feel as long that long ago. It's like you you would think that when you get to be like 60, 
40 years ago would seem like, you know, another, you know, the previous century, which it was, but a memory is a very tricky thing. And so it seems both a long time ago and very recent at the same time. I, it's a kind of strange paradox how time works that way, but it does seem to do that. Did, did you miss the uh, the process of the production of the original um, Gremlins um, back back then? I mean, it, it might, when when you first got on board, this must have been fairly you know new and eye opening. Do you mean the which part of the process are you referring to? Just the whole like, thing? Like, yeah, just like working on that production. I mean, you know, um, you you might call it you know Gizmo back then a, a relic, but it, it, mu it must you know it must have been something completely new oh my god at the time i was 19 years old i was an avid reader of famous monsters of Filmland, starlog i knew all about rick baker and rob botin and all the special effects experts and so working with chris Wayless and going to his creature shop and being part and parcel of the animatronics and seeing what was at that time absolute cutting edge technology it was nothing less than thrilling so I had it, oh my God, I had the time of my life doing Gremlins. Was it annoying occasionally? Sure. Did you have to do a lot of repetition? Of course. Was the final product and, you know, deeply satisfying? 100%. So, I mean, you know, anytime you do something difficult, you're going to have some, you know, with some technical issues and problems, you're going to have some moments of frustration. But overall, the, the project itself was a very joyful occasion. I think... You know, I, I think everyone in the cast really loved it. I think Joe Dante and Mike Fennell didn't quite know, and Chris Wayless, especially, who did the effects, didn't quite know, you know, the extent to which what they had bitten off in terms of the workload. Because once I finished, you know, first week of August of 83, they went on for all of August, September, October, and part of November. So it was almost like two shoots one with the actors that was three and a half months and then another three and a half months with just doing puppets mm -hmm. and i do think that joe dante by the end of it and mike finnell the producer and all the people in the effects department were pretty crispy fried at the end because it was it was like seven eight weeks and that's not even counting the pre-production which was a year and a half beforehand it was like two years of doing this over and over and over every day and I think they were i think they quite frankly by the time it was over they were relieved because they were tired yeah 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 well i i don't want to like you know keep, keep it all conversation about gremlins but I, but I do want to bring up one 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 more question is sure you know, you know it, with, with these big franchises it almost it almost seems like they 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 always rebooted like every 30 years do you think would you do you think like gremlins should be rebooted or just kept it you know, in its original state, like when you when you started? Well, you know, uh, one of the things that's interesting about Gremlins is, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I'm, I'm fairly certain. And that is that Chris Columbus, uh, who wrote the screenplay, has part ownership of the rights. And I think quite simply, he's not allowing it to be rebooted. He thinks the first, he, he doesn't need the money. Mm -hmm. He's filthy rich from all sorts of movies, whether it's Home Alone or the or Harry Potter series or whatever. And as a result, he doesn't need the money and he'd rather hang on. It's like, um, so it's sort of like asking him to destroy like his favorite family portrait. And so he doesn't go along with it. Um, and so I don't think you'll ever really see a reboot as long as he's alive. Uh, I could be mistaken about that, but I'm pretty sure I've read him say that in a press interview. Hmm. So I think they probably would have loved to have rebooted a bunch of times since then, but they can't. Um, and that's why they're more invested in Gremlins 3. And that's why Chris Columbus, and this I do know for 100% fact, uh, that's why we know that Chris Columbus did a, a full draft of a Gremlins 3 that he talked about publicly in which he talks about, you know, it does gizmo become is gizmo eventually at risk of becoming a public health menace because he spawns deadly creatures and should he in fact be i guess euthanized is the term or or caged to put away forever and put in a maximum security prisoner somewhere where he can't 
harm society. So um, I don't know what the response was to that particular draft. Just because it hasn't been made doesn't mean it wasn't good. They could easily be De Warner Brothers discoveries going through a certain amount of turmoil, shall we say, and uh, they also um, could easily just be waiting to see what the not one but two seasons of the animated show, what the impact on on people's awareness of the Gremlins franchise is before they're going to hurl a quarter of a billion dollars at a Gremlins three. You know, they would need probably to do Gremlins three. And some of the scenarios I've heard described, if they're not going to turn it into a Cobra Kai and make it a Netflix series, if they're going to make it a standalone studio movie, they'd have to throw at least a couple hundred million dollars at it. So you really need, as a corporation, you need to justify that expense for something that hasn't had a live action feature since 1990, which is now 34 years ago. So it's kind of like, imagine if they hadn't made a Terminator movie in 34 years, now they want to make one. It's like, do people still remember what that is? We better find out. That is that is true. That is true. It it, it is a different generation um, now now these days. Well, Zach, I've I've taken uh, a lot of your time. I want to appreciate uh, you uh, speaking to us about the Midnight Peep Show. Um, it, it 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 is a I've I've seen the whole. I've seen the whole movie. I can't wait for audiences and you yourself to see to see the whole movie. So re really appreciate it. And hopefully we get to do this again next time, Zach. Thank you. I appreciate it.